Welcome to episode 1843. This is 1843. And our background today, if you're watching the video, will be the clouds. <laughs> because I'm up in the clouds back from my four-day retreat with the Collective Mastermind Group. Of course, that's the mastermind group that I run with Ken McElroy and George Gammon. And these events are frankly ridiculous. <laughs> I mean that in a good way. They are ridiculous. I gained four pounds. We eat so lavishly and drink lavishly and just have such a good time at these events and learn so much. We had, of course, Robert Kiyosaki spoke to the group for the third time. He's pretty much an honorary member. He comes to all the events. Then we had Dr. Peter McCullough. You heard him on my show, of course. He's one of the few voices out there telling the truth about COVID-1984 and the shot in the arm. By the way, here's his book. He has a new book out, The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. He signed these books and gave them to all of our members there. And wow, I introduced him and he spoke for about an hour. Really amazing, telling stuff. Very, very interesting. Of course, the videos have been banned. They've been taken down, removed. One of my own was removed. And we all know what's going on with that. You know, the truth is something that the elites don't want people to know. You know, it's not the official narrative, so they don't want them to know. They don't want us to know, I should say. And after Peter spoke, he was there with his co-author, really interesting guy as well, who's really a historian and just had a lot of interesting stuff to share. Then I hosted a Q&A session for another hour. And then we I thought, you know, I, I was eating lunch there and I, I said to one of the other members, I said, where is everybody? And she said, well, they're, they're still in the other room. So I walk over back into the other room and everybody was on stage with Peter, taking photos, asking questions, crowding around him for about another half hour. I mean, there is just such a thirst for alternative viewpoints for the truth. I mean, this guy is credible. He's got, 50, I think now, 57 peer-reviewed papers on this subject, yet almost no exposure, almost a complete blackout. It's just incredible. He's testified in front of the U.S. Senate multiple times on the topic, and it's just crazy. I mean, we are living in extraordinary times. We really are. We also had, interestingly, Rolo Tomasi, speak as well. If you don't know who that is, he's written a book series. I've read most of them entitled The Rational Male. Again, another controversial person. But really, you know, in this kind of battle between the sexes, right? We've got to have, one of the things I said before we introduced him is we've got to have kind of the Stephen Covey principle. You know, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was a very influential book. I used to train on those topics from Stephen Covey's great work. And one of them is win-win or no deal. Win-win or no deal. And the system we have now, now this is an informal social system, it's not a win-win deal. And that has caused half of the human population, namely men, to go on strike. And this whole prevalence of social media, he talked a lot about that and the dynamic and the way that plays into the whole thing. And it's really messing up the culture. If you haven't seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma, I think it's called The Social Dilemma, and how these companies are basically getting people addicted, addicted to their platforms. Now, this is more addictive to women than it is to men. And there's all kinds of reasons because of the way the brain works and, you know, the differences in the, in the male versus female brain. And it is just caught wreaking havoc in the social structure of the entire world. Really just interesting stuff. I encourage you to study it. You know, we've touched on it before in prior episodes. We'll do it again. I'll probably have Rolo on a future 10th episode show to talk about this stuff. But it's, it's really, truly, truly shocking stuff. And we really need to be on guard and aware of what is happening to us as people, how they have manipulated the way dopamine and serotonin work in our brains to make us addicted. It's like a gambling casino, which you know is another business that just preys on 
human psychology and physiology and biochemistry to sell their products. I, I mean, it's it's absolutely awful. It, it really is. It's it's very manipulative, and hopefully, this stuff will be exposed for what it is, and the people behind it will be held to account. But I doubt it. <laughs> so I'm not optimistic about that one, folks. All right. So I told you that I talked to you about this this big thing you're going to hear in the news. This is going to come up a lot this year. We're really not hearing it yet, but it's going to be a big deal. So let me explain it to you. Last week, I, I told you I'd explain this to you. And by the way, our guest today will be two clients. We're going to do a client case study today. And I know you always love these case studies. I appreciate the great feedback we've had from all of our listeners and viewers on these client case studies. You know, real clients that have done real things and built real wealth through our network. And so we're going to have that in just a moment. But first, I want to uh, tell you about this thing last week that I, I promised I'd talk about. So this is going to be all over the news soon. So get ready. Are you ready? Because this will be in the news very, very shortly, my prediction. And it is going to be, you're going to be hearing about and reading about builder contract cancellations. Here's the way this works. A lot of people purchased new homes. Now, this is true in resale homes to a much lesser degree. So that's why I'm talking about new homes, because it's much more pronounced there, and you'll see why in just a moment. So as so many people have gone out and purchased new construction homes, and of course, you know, we've reported on it many, many times, there are many construction delays, supply chain problems, labor problems, etc. So it's taking a lot longer to finish these new construction homes than really ever before. And so as these construction timelines drag out, even without these delays, it was really impossible for buyers to lock in their rates for such long times for construction times. But now they're even longer. And so the buyers cannot lock in their mortgage rates. And as we all know, lenders are doing really sleazy things and they are not honoring rate locks. They are trying to weasel out, and it's awful what they're doing. They should be held to account. I hope a lot of people sue them. That would be the right thing to do. They need to get sued over this because nobody does the right thing anymore, sadly, and unless there's a consequence, right? We are witnessing the collapse of civilization, folks, right here. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy the decline, as Aaron Clary says. We're witnessing it. We're, we're part of it right now as, as we see this moral decay, ethical decay. So it's happening with lenders. So they're finding reasons not to honor rate locks. But they don't even have to with new construction because there are no rate locks Generally, I mean, there might be a few out there, but it's extremely rare to see a rate lock that is, you know, nine months or 12 months long, the, the amount of time it might take nowadays to build a new home. So a lot of people went out, they bought new homes. Let's say, for example, they bought a $350,000 house. And most people, when they buy, they buy the maximum they can afford, right? They stretch their budget to the limit. And they buy as much home as they can qualify for. So they've done this. They signed that purchase contract. They got pre-qualified and pre-approved with a lender for that $350,000 home. And that might have been at a 3 or 3.5% interest rate. Well, now those interest rates have bumped up quite dramatically, as we all know, because we have this dysfunctional, centrally planned economy. By the way, sorry for my, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of missing my words a little bit. I, I went to bed at 3 a.m. I didn't want to miss a day. So just like the week before, I flew home from Dallas where our collective mastermind meeting was. And I went to bed at 3 a.m. Yeah, not, not ideal, not ideal. Maybe one more cup of coffee will do the job. But anyway, these people locked in their rates or they didn't lock in their rates. They purchased the maximum home they could afford, which in this example, first-time buyer, $350,000 home. I remember when a first-time buyer home used to be $100,000, but that ain't the world we live in nowadays. So they got their $350,000 home, and they're going to be forced to cancel that contract because they no longer qualify for that loan. So the media will now report 
thousands and thousands of buyers, tens of thousands of home buyers are canceling contracts. And that means the market is going to collapse. And that means everybody's in trouble and the real estate market is going down and there's a crash. And most people will hear that news and they'll think, oh my God, it's true. Chicken Little, where's Chicken Little? The sky is falling. And they will be wrong. They will be totally wrong. Why will they be wrong? Because what they don't tell you, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark, is that thousands and thousands of other people, maybe probably tens of thousands actually, purchased a house for 450000 And they had the exact same problem. And tens of thousands of other people purchased a house for $600,000. And they now have the exact same problem. So all of these cancellations in all of these price ranges will occur and the media will report this. But what they won't report is that the marketplace will be forced to adjust their expectations. Remember, what gives? What gives is the standard of living. People simply accept less. They have to. They have no other choice. Remember the acronym I've shared with you, TINA? Are there any listeners named TINA out there? Comment below. TINA stands for there is no alternative. T-I-N-A. There is no alternative. So they will simply buy a less expensive house. And for those first-time buyers, they will just continue to rent, putting upward pressure on rents. And everybody will move down the socioeconomic ladder. But did they really move down? No, not really. Because the question is, compared to what? Compared to what? Well, they moved down compared to a year ago when rates were at the lowest level in 5,000 years and home prices hadn't soared quite as much as they have now, right? Because it's, of course, a combination of inflation, incomes, interest rates, and home prices, right? Compared to 18 months ago, compared to two years ago, their standard of living is lower, no question. But what about compared to five years ago or 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, it was also higher because prices were so, so low, even though interest rates were higher. But look, if you follow the Hartman Comparison Index, and I don't have time to go into it today, we've got to get to our guest, our client case study. But you understand the comparison and you understand the true values of things. So my point is, when you hear these stories about cancellations, you need to look up. Why do I have this graphic on the screen of the girl looking up at the sky, right? Laying in the leaves, looking up at the sky. The reason is because we need to look up. We need to look at the buyer above and how they are going to move down. And everybody's going to just move one rung down the ladder. Now, you might be asking, well, Jason, doesn't this affect the high-end market? Well, I don't know the answer. When I don't know something, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Because it's complicated. Like my favorite Facebook relationship status. I think that's so funny. You know, it's complicated. Are you single, married, or it's complicated? <laughs> I love that. It's That just makes me laugh. I don't know why. It's always complicated. And so in the high-end market, you know, this is different, right? It's The people aren't necessarily stretching to their last dollar in the high-end market. A lot of them paying cash, a lot of different things. But in the lower and middle segments of the market, it's much easier to understand this. In the high-end market, there's all kinds of cross-currents and interesting dynamics, okay? So the answer at the high-end, I don't know, okay? But it doesn't matter to us. As investors, all we simply need to know is all those first-time buyers that are going to cancel their builder contracts, they're going to stay in the rental pool. The people above them are going to move down and buy the houses they would have purchased. And the people above them are going to move down and buy the houses those other people had to cancel on. And that's the way it works. They simply move a rung down the socioeconomic ladder. That's the way the dynamics of markets work. Will the media tell you this? Nah, they don't understand it. They don't want to report it. Even if they did understand it, they don't want to report it because the old saying, if it bleeds, it leads. We want to report bad news. As humans, we are conditioned to see negativity because throughout the vast majority of our evolution, that was our survival skill. 
we needed to see danger. We needed to see negativity. But in this overly abundant world, it's just not the same. The same rules don't apply anymore, yet we're still wired with our primitive monkey brains, right? That's, that's what guides us. So get ready for the cancellations. You're going to hear about it, okay? But whether the market moves up, down, or it's stable, like, you know, so what? Who really cares? Because it's not a binary bet. We understand that income property is a multi-dimensional asset class, and we as investors listening to this show, we take multi-dimensional bets, and that's how we win the game. Now, last call for Jacksonville this weekend. Come and join me. Come and join our leader for our wholesale workshop in Jacksonville. And by the way, if you're going, do you know Friday evening there is a Sting concert? And I think maybe we should all go. What do you think of that? So if you're interested in going to the Sting concert, reach out to your investment counselor and reach out to us. Let us know. Maybe we'll get a little group and we'll we'll go to the concert Friday night. But Saturday, we're going to have a lavish dinner. We're going to have a great time together. We're going to spend three days together in Jacksonville and wholesale properties. Now, you can do this anywhere in the country and you can do it in many other countries as well. Wholesaling, great way to build capital and make money with a more active approach to real estate investing. On the bottom of the screen, if you're watching the video, that is the link. If you want to register or you want more information, go to jasonhartman.com slash wholesale. That's jasonhartman.com slash wholesale. And join us this weekend in Jacksonville, Florida. It's going to be a great time. We're going to share a lot of meals together, hang out together, ride around together, look at the market. We're going to have instruction. We're going to be in the field. We're going to be in the hotel room and doing classroom style, but in the field work as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So get ready for that. Now, we've got our weekly winners of the $50 Amazon gift card. So one is from a YouTube comment, and the handle is no, no. Okay, no, no, congratulations. Yes, yes, you won. <laughs> you won the $50 gift card. <laughs> and the comment was about recession equals unemployment. And anyway, it's a long comment. I, I won't read it right now because we've got to jump to our guest here. And I always, I always go long because, hey, no one ever accused me of being short-winded. And then another winner wrote a review on Apple Podcast. Hey, Jason, I love the show and have listened for about two years and, and gained a wealth of knowledge and now have two rentals thanks to the confidence I acquired from listening to the show. Thanks, Matt. And Matt's handle, by the way, is Common Review. So Common Review, go to jasonhartman.com slash ask and claim your $50 gift card. And then no, no, from your YouTube comment, also go to jasonhartman.com slash ask and claim your $50 gift card. All right, without further ado, let's get to our client case study and I'm gonna go get another cup of coffee. <laughs> Here we go. I think you'll really enjoy this client case study. I am happy to bring you another client case study today. We have Chuck and Danny Gillette with us. They have 23 properties. And like all of us real estate investors, they've had some good times and some challenging times. And we're going to go into that today. They've got some unique strategies. They are brothers and they are investing together. So they're doing some really cool stuff there. It's just my pleasure to welcome them. Chuck and Danny, welcome. How are you? Doing good. Well, Hello, Jason. It's good to be here. Good yeah. to have you. And we're all located in Utah right now. I happen to be in Salt Lake City, and both of you are in Utah as well. You grew up right outside of Salt Lake City, right? Yes, we did. That's right. Fantastic. A town called Bountiful, maybe not so little, but uh -huh. not too far away from Salt Lake. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, tell us, how did you come to decide that you wanted to be real estate investors? Well, I... Our dad was a real estate investor. He had a couple of properties. And so we grew up with those properties, really detested those properties. We had to, all we had to do, we had to paint and mow the lawn and <laughs> do things like that at the time. I didn't think it was so great. I remember, I remember doing a whole roof by myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so, so to your thinking, rental properties were just a lot of just, handyman work, right? Yeah. And, and our, our dad was yeah. very middle class. You know, we, we weren't, didn't have a lot of extra money you know my needs and most a lot of our wants but 
we're taken care of. But I remember talking to my dad. He kept on saying, it's a great tax shelter. That's what he always says. It's a great tax shelter. That's what I remember. So as a kid, though, I didn't think it was so great. <laughs> right. But uh, at some point in time, he, I think what, eventually at some point in time, he gave us each, gifted us, he sold the properties and he gifted us $10,000. And that was like, oh, well, hey, maybe this this real estate thing's not such a bad maybe idea. Maybe real estate, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> This was uh, 30 years ago or whatever, 10,000 worth, a little bit more. But so Chuck and I, uh, when our first homes that we bought, I think that was your first home, right, Chuck? That you bought? Well, uh, yeah, my first home I bought was a duplex. Yep. Uh, and I bought a duplex as well uh, at my first home. And that worked out great. Uh, at some point in time, our first property together was a fourplex in Bountiful. And we still have that property. That's a great property. I, I and then after that, we got some property in a place called Studio City. It was uh, student housing. <laughs> that, that was kind of, that was a big mistake. <laughs> that was a big mistake. Well, what was wrong with the student housing property? Was that just a lot of work, difficult student tenants, partiers? What? One thing I didn't notice about that is is I was always worried to death because fall uh, semester would start and it would always be like half empty, mm-hmm. like a week before the school was going to start. So we're always worried to death. Then all of a sudden it would fill up all the procrastinators would fill it up the last week. But that was a scary. But the biggest problem is that that place was settling and we didn't get issues. an inspection. We didn't get an inspection. We, we didn't know what we were doing. Was that in Utah as well? Yes, that's, that's in yep. Utah. Yep. So this was the beginning of your investment career. What happened later? How did you come across me and my content? Was it the podcast or, or YouTube? Or uh, so we got a little discouraged after that one. And I always kind of seen this as my way to get away from my nine to five job and, and be able to you know retire and, and not work for the man. But we got discouraged after this one. And so we weren't doing much. And so Chuck calls me up one time. Hey, you should listen to this pod, this Jason Hartman guy. So yeah. So I started listening to you. Now I had I had two beefs with you. I was a Dave Ramsey guy first. Uh-huh. Was was uh, the refi till you die? I'm like that's just that doesn't make sense. You got you got to pay your debts off. <laughs> so and so my other my other one was going out of state, not not being you know. Do, I want to do everything local, right? Local yeah. investing, yeah, yeah. But I was listening to you. I thought, well, he's you know, he's it sounds smart enough, and he's got some good ideas. Why don't I take his model and I'll try to find something local? I told Chuck, I'll try to find something local. I'll take his model. I didn't have, then it was like 12% cash on cash returns. That's what we were getting at that time, which, which is, would be wonderful. You don't get those really right now anymore. But So I found a property, but it was 90 years old. It was this old property. Right. It, it met those credits. We bought it and we it had all kinds of problems. We had to dig up the front lawn and I, I, we ended up doing well on that one because some guy wanted it for his mother-in-law, the next door neighbor and paid us top dollar for it. But we, we didn't have that for very long. But at that point in time, I said, okay, Chuck, let's go into Jason Hartman's network. And that was about 10 years ago. And now we have 23 properties. Most of those are through your network. And I, I, and I retired, I'm retired. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So Danny retired one month ago and you told me before we started today that you wouldn't have been able to do that without the income properties you bought through us, right? No. See, my plan when I got into at the very beginning, when I got the duplex, I wanted to retire on the income party, but I got discouraged. The management was really hard to do. I couldn't find properties where I could get a property manager as well, at least in Utah locally. Right. And so it just became a lot of work and I just, you know, this isn't going to work out, but you know, working through your network and able to get these properties out of state that makes sense, you know, have the cash flow to help us even with property managers. And it's just been great. It's, it's, yeah. it's just, and you, the way you've, your vision is much bigger than I had imagined. Um, and so the, you really helped me with, with that, that vision and, and the, infra, and, and kind of, I, I mean, I knew about all these different concepts, but you, kind of organize those for me and, and help me uh, move forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I would say, Danny, one thing that Jason taught us was the value of the single family home. Because yes. before we always thought real estate investing meant duplexes, and fourplexes. And uh, in Utah, it's kind of hard to buy a single family home and find it that you could rent it out and find some cash flow. Whereas we found these other markets, it was much easier to find those type of properties. Mm-hmm. And then Jason, you always talk about how single family homes has a chance for bigger chance for appreciation than the duplexes and the fourplexes. And we've certainly seen that. And that's been pretty amazing these last few years. 
Yeah. yeah. Good, yeah. good stuff. What what did you mean about the bigger vision? I mean, you kind of knew you wanted to retire on real estate, but you said that I brought you a bigger vision of, of well, investing. I, what, what do you mean by that? I would never have thought I'd have this many properties. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I was kind of thinking I would buy properties and pay them off and not use the, the power and the, multiple, the multiplier effect of leverage as much. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was just a big... And it really took me a while to get over that to to refund it. Now now I'm refining my house every other month. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm just every time I see equity sitting there being lazy, I'm like, I gotta get that. You know, I'm I was doing loans against my 401k. I mean, I'm just I, I didn't realize how much money I had laying around. Yeah not doing stuff for me. Right. Good for you. Good for you. And, so and, see, you know, the Dave Ramsey method would have slowed you down dramatically. Yes. I mean, instead of 23 properties, you'd be at maybe three properties by now. Yeah. Four I'd properties. be trying to pay them off, you know? And yeah, it, it, that did take me a while to get to really embrace. In fact, we, we did some flipping. We tried some flipping, Chuck and I, mm-hmm. and we even, we even, we even bought we a house. pretty successful at it, yeah. Yep. Well, we we were okay. It wasn't. We didn't make as much money as we thought we would, though. It was a little too much work for the value. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. And we even got a house. We we even bought a house, and then we subdivided. Had a lot of land. We subdivided, and then we built two new houses on that. Right, and we did pretty good on that one, except for it took forever, and we used all cash. We were still thinking, oh well, we'll just use all cash, and. And it took two years. And so we had all that cash bottled up in these in this for two years when we could have been buying other stuff. Right. The, the opportunity cost that it wasn't supposed True. to take two years. It was supposed to only take six months, ended up being two years, right? Because mm-hmm. the the and so we had we had tons of cash just bottled up and there was some opportunity costs lost because we were we were afraid to use leverage in even in those building those you know, building those homes and stuff. So yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's that's good to hear and understand. I mean, look, you know, for those who are interested in flipping, it can be a great business, but you've got to be set up for it. It is a business. It's not something you do as a hobby, you know. It's a real business. If you have the crews, if you have the knowledge, if you have the software, you know, if you have the right insurance, you know, all of that stuff, then great, go for it, you know, but that's a a business and you want to think more like scaling it up and making it big whereas the buy and hold investing you know you can do that at your own pace right you know but but flipping it it really works a lot better with scale you know when you when you have crews that are really dependent on you and you have supplier relationships and all of that kind of stuff and when you're just doing one just yeah. when you're just a small guy you just, just really just, hard you know, that's why it took two years because we were a small guy and our yep. our contractors were going to give us I, mean, we, I always thought if we would have got the banks, if we would have gotten you know, construction loans, yeah. if the banks might have helped us communicate with our contracts and right. get this done, you know, yeah. you're taking too long. So anyway, it was, it was, there was, there was some opportunity costs there. We, we did well, but, but because it took so long, our, our return investment was a lot lower just based on time versus, you know, just the dollar amount. But. Sure, sure. So let's talk about uh, your background a little bit. Chuck, what do you do for a living? Yeah, so uh, I actually work for city government. I'm a public works director and city engineer for a small city here near St. George called Ivins, Utah. Okay, fantastic. And uh, Danny, what do you do? Or what did well, you do? I, I retired. <laughs> I, I did work for a company called General Thomas Aeronautical Systems. Um, they build the... Uh, the Predator drones, huh? the, oh, wow. the Reaper drones, the Avenger drones. So I worked in the mission side of that. And so we would, we wrote software to collect, to, to uh, interface with the big sensors they put on the big video turrets or the big hyperspectral cameras, the big synthetic aperture, aperture radar cameras to, that collects data. And then we would get, we would command the sensors, get the data, and ex, and ex, uh, exploit it and disseminate it to people that need it. Wow, interesting. So, so you had a security clearance then, of course. Right? I did. Oh, wow. I did. Yeah, I did. It was a great job. I loved it. I loved it. I, I, you know, but I sure love working for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and be retired, right? Now, Chuck, is that your goal too? Do you want to retire like Danny did? You know, I. I don't mind working actually. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's, my job is pretty enjoyable and, mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, I love it. Uh, 
I might, I might retire early. It depends. I've got kids in school. I'll definitely work while kids are still in school. When they get out, maybe I'll reevaluate that. Maybe I will retire early. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just kind of depends how I feel at the time. Are you guys, and, and Danny, I don't know if you have kids too, but uh, are you guys getting your kids into real estate like your, your dad did for, to you guys? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my kids, I have three kids. They, they do the data entry for me. My oldest son was like my handyman up here. He seemed a lot more excited about it than what I was, I, but he, he became a handyman. He'd go down and do things in the fourplex. We used to have a duplex in Ogden and yeah, he, he did some painting there and, and fix. So he, he's on a mission right now in Santiago, Chile. So I don't have his services anymore, but yeah, he, he, used, he was my handyman for a while. Was really, I love paying him as a handyman. He was a lot cheaper. A, he was cheaper <laughs> than the most handyman, but and he got money. So that, that was all good, good. Chuck, how about you? Are you involving the kids? Well, I think it's really useful to have the kids kind of have their vision opened up, kind of like our dad opened our vision up to real estate. Um, I think they see the benefit. I don't get, uh, I don't have any properties nearby. Like we used to, we had one property nearby my house, but we don't have it anymore. We sold it so we could buy more properties. So we could buy three properties in Florida, but um, I I just see the value of them uh, kind of understanding and being kind of financially literate about some of these opportunities. Uh Uh-huh. By the way, you just made me think of, and then that's great. I hope you both told your kids it's a great tax shelter, like your father told you. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, and more. Yeah. It's ideal, is what I tell them. I D E A L. That's the acronym, right? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. so income depreciation, equity buildup, equity. appreciation, and leverage, right? Yeah. I D E A L. I know that in the beginning, when you first found my work about ten years ago, you were really not wanting to do, or not convinced that remote investing was a thing to do. How did you come around to that? I mean, Danny, you mentioned it a little bit, but you know, Chuck, what were your thoughts on it? That was a stretch for you guys. It sounds like it was definitely a stretch. I remember, you know, one of the things that made me feel confident about it was because sometimes you listen to these things. Well, is it a scam? Is it what not? And I felt better in the fact that you were interviewing people like Robert Kiyosaki, which both Danny and I had read his books, and you know have a lot of respect for what he's talking about. And once you started looking at the deals and realizing that, hey, there's enough cash flow in these out-of-state deals where you could pay a property manager, I think I think that's what convinced me that it would be a good idea. And right. tried to get Danny to convince as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and for me, I didn't give cash flow the attention I always needed to because my, my thought at first was, I don't even care if I make money because it's going to appreciate and it's going to, you know, it's going to go up in value and that that's how I'm going to get my, my wealth. And I didn't understand the importance of a, of a good cash on cash return. I do now. And, and thanks to you, Jason, that was one thing that really was like, you know, I can see the benefit of that, but we just couldn't find anything local that had those cash on cash returns. Yeah. So we had to go out of state and even with property managers to get those cash on cash returns. It was just amazing. I was like, well, this is what we're doing. And, and it became apparent that's just not a problem with real, you know, with technology, it's just it's just not an issue anymore that you have to go local. You, we don't even see the properties we, we buy anymore, but right. every, all that information is there and we, we have it. We can feel secure. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You know, a thing that people have come to understand, I mean, when I started doing this back in 2003, 2004, people were really, really reluctant to invest far away with properties they hadn't seen and all of this stuff. But technology has improved. And as the industry's gotten more and more established, people are much more open to it now. And, you know, most of our clients have a little bit of wealth and, you know, some have a lot, but they live in nicer areas, right? So those nicer areas are never going to be the right places to invest because they're not going to have good cash flow. They're not going to have good rent to value ratios. So, you know, you you live in one place, but you invest in other places. You know, I, I would say invest in places that make sense so you can afford to live in places that don't make sense. <laughs> so <laughs> that's... Uh, that's one thing to think about. Now, let's talk a little bit, if we could, about management and self-management. I know you've got properties in Memphis, in Chicago land area, and I, I think Florida as well. I'll, I'll, we can talk about what markets, but just on the management note here, you have five properties with one manager and you pulled two away from them. 
And I, I found it interesting what you told me before we started today, that not only did those two properties become better when you self manage them, but the three properties that you left with the manager got better as well, because now the manager sort of was on notice that you could leave, right? And they started doing a better job. Can you tell us a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, there's no question. Like I say, in Chicago, we were kind of bleeding for a while with the costs. And uh, and the math like, bankruptcy really hurt us too. Yeah. But, but you were doing better than you thought though, right? It, it, yeah, whenever we do the math, it's like, well, it's not that bad, but it's just, you know, we just, Chicago is not landlord friendly and it, it, it's a litigation state and it's just all that that goes with it. Um, yeah. Left wing state, but yeah, exactly. it is, you know, it's like the only cheap world-class city in the U.S. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, you can't do anything close to that in L.A., San Francisco, New York, uh, you know, Boston, Washington, D.C., Miami, anything like that. So that is the one thing Chicago really has going forward. It's a it's a brand name city, a worldwide brand name city, and it's inexpensive, you know. But yeah, but ever since we pulled those two properties and we're just not bleeding anymore. And I, you know, maybe it was lucky, but I don't think so. I think, you know, we basically told our managers, hey, you know what, we'll pull our properties. If we're not cash flowing, then we'll find another way to do it. And, so, and ever since so you, you pulled great. two of the properties and started self-managing them. Now, any tips you can share with people about self-management, any tools that you use, you know, ways that you did it, did you keep the existing tenants in the property or did you do an actual lease up remotely yet? Um, no, we, we, we have had to do a couple of lease ups, not for those properties, but for some other properties. Um, All right. we, have, we, we use a product called hemlane.com. Yeah, I use Hemlane. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I we heard about them on one of your your podcasts many years ago. Right. We love Hemlane that time. It's kind of it kind of fits the 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 middle ground of a quasi property manager. They handle the maintenance. Yeah, is all handled to them, but we handle we use our tools to collect rent and handle all the rent issues if there's any rent issues. Let, let, let me just talk about that for a minute, if I may, because this is really great that you brought this up. Yeah. So I believe the link is jasonhartman.com slash hemlane. You can go check it out. Okay, they've got a special offer on our affiliate link. But one of the things that some of these software companies are now doing is they are acting, like Danny said, like quasi property managers, where they actually handle and coordinate repair and maintenance issues. It's amazing. It is amazing. I did another show with uh, another one that does that just recently, and that'll be on my Jason Hartman R-E-N-T, Real Estate News and Technology channel. That's a smaller YouTube channel I have that really specializes in like software demos and real estate technology, okay? So it's a, a secondary YouTube channel I've got. And they handle the repair and maintenance stuff too. Now, the thing about Hemlane, you know, I don't enable that feature on mine because what I didn't like is that they had these minimum thresholds that you had to agree to, like the property managers, and I didn't like that. But at least they don't have the conflict of interest that the property managers have in terms of those repair thresholds. It sounds like you haven't had an issue with that. It sounds like you're happy with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I can set the repair the, the repair thresholds to anything I want them to be. There's a minimum, though. Oh, they, minimum? Maybe, maybe, maybe we haven't we haven't hit the minimum then. Yeah. But uh, the thing that I love most about Hemline and Chuck can feel it, is how transparent it is. Because you go to a property manager, even their web, you go to their websites. It's I know. It's opaque. You just don't you don't see. You don't know how many people they've contacted. What? What? We found an issue where they told us they had contacted three. We found out they they lie. Them. Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> Imagine and their monthly statements. It's, it's opaque. We don't see it, but it's so transparent. I see everyone they're talking to. I can interject anything I want to. In fact, uh, we have we use it for some properties in, in Florida as well. And I, uh, we were doing some HVAC work, and so they they have to call licensed and and um, certified contractors yeah. we have this hvac guy his name is brother chuck it's not my brother chuck but he's brother he's like a hvac yeah. evangelist or something so okay got it. <laughs> but anyway I, I just put them in there say i want you to use this guy and they said okay yeah and they use this guy and and, and i just see it. it's transparent i see everything that happens i know folks let me tell you everybody listening or watching try self-managing 
-hmm. okay? Get the tools set up. You know, this is one of many tools. There are other great tools too. I teach a lot about this in the Empowered Investor Inner Circle. We're always talking about this on our monthly Zoom meetings. You will experience a degree of control that will just give you such peace of mind with your properties. It is it is just fantastic to self-manage. I self-manage all my properties now. I do not have any more managers. Everything is 100% self-managed. I love it. It's so easy. It's amazing that it's actually easier than having a manager many times. Like people, they all think, I don't have time. It's less time. <laughs> it's You're, you're not There's dealing with a third here. party getting in the middle. It's just easy. It's so easy. Like, do it. Try it. You know, just join our Empowered Investor Inner Circle and we'll help you with it. Okay. It's really great to self-manage. So you've got Memphis, Chicago, and where in Florida do you have properties? We're all over in Florida. Uh -huh. uh, we have some in the Ocala area. Uh, we got some in Orlando area, just, a, just North Orlando. We got Palm Spring, uh, Palm, Coast, Palm Coast, Palm Coast, Deltona, Deltona, Lakeland, uh, Tampa. Uh, we kind of by Tampa Bay. There's a Winter Haven area yep. there. Yeah. Uh, we're down Port South. Charlotte too. Port Charlotte, yeah. Sure, sure. You're not self managing any of those, I'm guessing, right? We're self managing two of those. Okay. And we're going to be moving two here pretty soon. Um, and then we're we're self managing all of our Memphis properties. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so you're, really, you're, you're really deep in the self-management. I love we're it. We're about half. We're about half and half right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Good for you. Good for you. So any other self-management tips you want to share with people? I think the key is for us is that hemlane.com yeah. software. Yeah. I don't think we could do it without them because they help us get the lease ups too. They, they help us find the agents that do the leases when we need the leases and yep. It almost feels like a full management software, but like Danny said, you're you're right in the middle of it. And you're seeing everything that's going on. Transparency. Yeah. I, love transparency. I just I just love it. I just every time when I see everything, I can inject, I can uh -huh. make comments, I can yeah. you know, it's just great. Yeah, yeah. You just got to find a really a tool, obviously, and Hamlet. It's just been great for us. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say, you know, it's great. There are many out there. I've done demos on Inago, Rent Ready, Hemlane, Avail, a whole bunch of them on my R E N T YouTube channel. So check those out. Look at the demo. I ask them tough questions. You know, I basically make the founder usually give a software demo. Okay. And they all have their little things that they're really good at. A Zebo is really interesting too. Like they all have these little strengths and weaknesses, right? And it's really interesting, but you'll find those demos on my real estate news and technology YouTube channel. Okay. They're all there. And, you know, we actually have the founder of Hemlane coming on our monthly empowered investor inner circle zoom meeting next month. She's going to be there and she's going to be answering questions and stuff. Is that like Diana that. or Dana. Dana, 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 Dana. Very helpful. So, so that's great. We are in this new age of the empowered investor, and you can really just do a lot of this stuff quite easily yourself. So take advantage of that, folks. Really, really do that. That's I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that, guys. As we wrap it up, what are your plans for your portfolio? Are you still wanting to buy more, or are you kind of satisfied with the 23 properties you have, or, or are you going to keep building? We have two more in the pipeline. Uh, we have three, through some pre builds that are going to be done. We have one more in the Port Charlotte area and then one in, oh, they're both in Port Charlotte actually. So those, yeah. they've taken forever to build and <laughs> put those under contract yeah. like 18 months ago. Yeah. They're still like six months out. <laughs> it's so, really slow. It's been slow with COVID and everything. Yeah. So, so, so we were kind of planning to kind of take a little bit break after this and, and kind of consolidate what mm -hmm. we've got. I actually have two. I, I moved all my retirement money into a solo 401k, and I have two pre-builds uh, going for my solo 401k through you guys, uh, one in Ocala and another one in Punta Gorda. Uh huh. Same, same, that same down south, southwest. Yeah. Of but and so I, that's that's my plan. But yeah, we're we're gonna take a little bit of a break after these last two get get purchased and uh, kind of consolidate. And we have one house that we had to purchase because we were doing a ten thirty one exchange and we purchased it outright. We didn't get a loan for it. We still, we still have that one that we need probably need to refinance and 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 buy some properties from. But we're gonna take a break for a little bit, maybe for a couple of years and. So you'll have 25 properties at that point, so right? We'll have 25, yeah. 
Good yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Well, hey, I just want to say thank you both very much for coming on and sharing your experience. All of our listeners and viewers love these shows where they're client case studies. If you're listening out there and you you want to share your story, uh, your investing journey, please reach out to us at jasonhartman.com slash ask. Chuck and Danny, we really just appreciate you sharing. And of course, we appreciate your business. <laughs> You're great customers, <laughs> great clients. So uh, we appreciate that too. And thanks for sharing all of this stuff. And I think people can learn a lot from these case studies. This is the real world stuff, you know, down and dirty. You know, it's not all roses, folks. There's definitely challenges. It's, it takes work, but, you know, you can achieve wealth a lot faster and it, just get a lot more control over your investments versus you know, the Wall Street alternative or, or anything else. Uh, so income property is, is great stuff. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. And, and I, I just want to Thank say you. thanks to you because I would never have been able to retire if I hadn't got hooked on to you 10 years ago. Oh, thank you. And, and, uh, and, and I really owe this to you that I've met my goal, you know, to retire early and not work for the man and, and kind of be my own boss. And, and I would never been able to do that had I not, like, I guess I was a little discouraged 10 years ago, but hooking onto your podcast and learning from what you were teaching has made this all possible. Thank you. It's been pretty huge. It's been awesome. Well, thanks guys. I really appreciate that. And that's what keeps me doing what I'm doing. (laughs) You know, I just love (laughs) hearing that. And I love hearing that we're helping people become financially independent. So that that's awesome. Thanks again for sharing. Appreciate it. 